Uh, I'm Tom Cargill uh, from the University of Nevada. And I have the honor to be a moderator. I'm uh, not sure what role I'm supposed to play here, say a few remarks, and then most importantly, make sure everybody sticks to the time constraints. Uh, as you all know, you know, Asia is in tremendous transition, and especially the, the three main players, China, uh, China, Japan, and Korea. But not all, I have to say, not all in unison. But one of the things, though, is that is a common denominator among these three uh, economies is the growing international interrelationship between their economies in terms of the exports and imports, and not just between the three economies, but with the rest of the world. And a rather amazing thing has been taking place in the last few years, where we have three free trade agreements being negotiated more or less simultaneously at the same time. Uh, quite amazing uh, uh, for these countries to start considering liberalization of trade. And these four papers focus on one of those free trade uh, uh, agreements, which would just be between uh, China, Japan, and Korea. And they view it from the perspective of uh, China, uh, from the perspective of South Korea, from the perspective of the United States, and then finally from the perspective of Japan. Uh, we're going to take the papers in the order in which the authors are setting here. Uh, Scott Harrell, uh, Chung Lee, and Claude, and TJ. Now, TJ Pimple is not officially here. He's not on the program. <laughs> uh, so, Scott? Oh, one last thing. Uh, each presenter has 20 minutes, and I'm going to start warning before we get there. But that, that constraint is rather binding uh, to the point that I'll probably pull them down. Uh, so we can have at least a half hour for discussion amongst the, the group here and ourselves up here. Scott? Thank you, Professor Cargill, and <clears throat> I'd like to echo uh, Abe's comments. Thank you, uh, Professor Rosman, for your leadership on this, and thank you, Abe, and the whole team for um, setting this up. And now, uh, after having thanked you, I'm going to have to ask you for help because there is no obvious uh, paper. Uh, PowerPoint loaded. So one of those nice ladies who's actually pointing a camera at me could maybe find the PowerPoint. Ah, great. Okay. <laughs> so without further ado, you know, you got a PhD in how to, you know, research. You don't get a PhD in how to, you know, operate a computer. Um, so okay. So my remit tonight was to talk about um, China's view of this proposed China-Japan-Korea FTA. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in basically four parts. This is going to look at uh, it's going to look at the origins and evolution of China's attitude towards this uh, FTA. Uh, it's then going to uh, look at the benefits that Chinese analysts see uh, envisioned from this FTA. Then it's going to turn to the problems that Chinese observers see when they think about how they could actually achieve this FTA. Um, and then finally, what strategies they are uh, debating to get them where they think they want to go. Um, just as an, at the outset, I want to talk a little bit about the sourcing for this paper. Uh, most of the sources for this paper come from open source, well, all of them come from open source materials, uh, from Chinese official government uh, policy statements, from academic uh, writings, from the Chinese media, uh, and then secondary writings in English and Chinese about this. Um, and the, you know, one of the things you could say up front anytime you're wrestling with China is, well, how do you know what you know? How do you know what Chinese government officials think? Uh, the unfortunate answer is we don't necessarily know. The best proxy we have in this case is to try to describe the entirety of the debate that's going on in the Chinese language, and then use that as a proxy to situate Chinese official thinking somewhere within that and talk about the boundaries left and right. Um, so open source materials don't necessarily tell you uh, exactly what is happening, but it can at least give you a flavor for what the Chinese themselves are probably hearing. And sometimes the individuals are going to be making decisions, or who are going to be advising the people who make decisions, have themselves been through an academic training uh, from gentlemen such as this, perhaps, in the Chinese context, uh, where their thinking has been shaped by uh, the kinds of ideas that are being talked about here. Um, just This is a, a quickie for those of you who may not be familiar with the, the trade uh, alphabet soup of uh, acronyms. Um, 
So uh, to start with, um, China's view of this FTA has evolved over time. The first uh, discussions of this really came up in the late 1990s in the aftermath of the 1997-1998 Asian financial crisis. And at that time, the uh, Chinese Bank Rate FTA was talked about primarily as a way to try to coordinate with the region, um, try to recover from the uh, shocks that the region had been through. Um, and in some ways, China's initial raising of this topic wasn't designed in one heartbeat to get them all the way to a concluded deal. It was instead a way for China to put an idea out there at a time when the U.S. was seen as having mishandled its relationship with Thailand in the crisis, its relationship with South Korea in the crisis. And China was able to really get a lot of diplomatic mileage, even though it was not a big idea at the time. It was something that was being talked about by the Chinese that looked positive to the region, which could say, hey, you know, Beijing is putting forward some useful ideas. Uh, in the early 2000s, to the mid-2000s, of course, those of you who are familiar with China know China was entering into the WTO and initiating uh, a set of negotiations with the ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia on their uh, China-ASEAN FTA. So during that period, China was really focusing on adapting to a major new change to the WTO, as well as pushing forward on a southern-oriented strategy to try and push what they were calling that. Uh, diplomatic initiative, a, uh, a charm offensive, some have labeled it. Um, and so during that time, there was really a shift away from a focus on trying to push a CJK FTA. Additionally, in Northeast Asia, there wasn't a whole lot of action at this time. The U.S. was not really pushing yet very hard uh, for the chorus FTA. There was not a lot of movement on any kind of a TPP. That was still a distant future. Um, and so there was less urgency for China to push on the CJK FTA because there really wasn't any competition. Uh, but by the late 2000s, as the economies of East Asia began to be buffeted by the crisis in the U.S. and the Eurozone, and then with Japan's own crisis after the triple disaster of 2011, the CJK FTA really took on increased value to China as a way to try to respond to extra regional crises and to try to build on some of the economic integration that had ensued in the aftermath of China's entry into the WTO. Uh, moreover, as I said, Chorus FTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreements that have been put forward um, really brought some new challenges to China and included challenges to China's efforts to build uh, what you might call an uh, economic, put itself in the economic driver's seat of Northeast Asia. Um, so, that is to say that as you look at this process over time, um, China's approach to FTAs and to this particular FTA have grown increasingly strategic. Um, here you see three quotes uh, from some Chinese writers on, uh, on FTAs, and one of them notes that the 17th Party Congress uh, in <clears throat> uh, has put forward for the first time an emphasis on uh, a free trade strategy uh, as a way to try to build China's national power. Um, the, the second and third quotes then say, in essence, you know, this is a way uh, that we do think that you don't pursue an FTA purely for economic reasons. They always carry diplomatic, political, and strategic implications. Uh, and finally, the last one really reflects the growing anxiety of Chinese writers who see the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement as a real threat to China's overall ability to put itself in the driver's seat in Northeast Asia to really exert a greater influence because they know that if they're locked out of that, they won't get to set the rules. They'll have a lot less authority in trying to uh, direct the region's economy, uh, which is why you see uh, language like the TPP as a, a strategic plot by the United States. Um, turning then to some of the benefits that uh, Chinese analysts see, I've divided this into two, uh, into two parts. Uh, first, there are official statements. The official statements focus almost exclusively on purely technical descriptions of what they expect. Um, the statements by the Ministry of Commerce and the State Council of Development Research Center tend to focus on uh, four big impacts. For example, increased demand, consumption, and investment, growing fiscal revenues, uh, rebalancing of trade in ways that will diminish the, uh, the difficulties that China has with its neighbors because it runs such large trade deficits. Uh, and a structural shift in the balance of trade away from low-value added labor-intensive goods towards more high-value added high-tech goods. Uh, and also, they also talk about three utilities, increased competition and efficiency, making the Chinese economy uh, operate more effectively, uh, matching up economic diplomacy with political diplomacy, uh, and enhancing, uh, the third is kind of a catch-all category, 
enhancing regional stability and just kind of general overall goodness for the economy. Things that will go, good things go together, and this will lead to counter piracy, this will lead to cooperation in other realms, uh, a whole host of areas. They also talk in very concrete terms about their estimates adding how many GDP points uh, per annum per annum, or how many, you know, 8 million new jobs. Uh, the estimates vary a bit, but those are the kinds of things the official policy statements talk about. They never get into the really meaty strategic stuff. That you get when you listen to the unofficial experts who can talk about this without carrying any diplomatic consequences for China. That's when you get the, the kind of geostrategic thinkers, the analysts who can say what they really feel and are not limited by um, the implications of their remarks for bilateral or, or multilateral relations. So this breaks down into two basic categories. The CJK FTA is basically seen as tethering uh, Asia's economic future to decisions made in Beijing, so putting Beijing in the driver's seat, allowing it to establish new regional norms, essentially giving it control over uh, Japan, Korea, and then by virtue of the leadership over those two enormous economies, of course, over North Korea, then they also basically would have leadership over all of East Asia because they already have greater influence than any country in Southeast Asia. Um, so you have a quote there from uh, Professor Wu saying, in essence, if we miss this chance to really grab leadership while it's in our hands, it will never be there again. Um, and then there's the secondary feature that is uh, kind of more negative. Uh, if the first is a positive or in, in IR speak, an offensive realist uh, approach of trying to grab more power. The second is a defensive realist uh, explanation that says, you know, they're very much pushing CJK also because it helps them to counter what they feel threatened by, i.e., the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement, which threatens to undo all the efforts they've made to try to build regional integration that's centered on Beijing. So, for example, Professor Hu of Fudan University says uh, that there's an essentially competitive relationship between TPP and the CJK FDA. The one is a US-led effort, the other is an effort that's a Chinese-led approach to economic integration. Um, <clears throat> turning then to the third portion of, uh, of this discussion, uh, Chinese analysts tend to talk about uh, five big obstacles to uh, ac accomplishing this kind of an FTA. Uh, first, they say, well, you know, we have very divergent political and cultural values with our neighbors. Uh, uh, Chinese analysts aren't blind. They know that those other countries are countries with the rule of law, with democracy, with representation of interests. Um, they're not governed by one-party dictatorships. And so there's a divergent political and cultural values. Second, they say, well, there's a lack of political trust. And this is actually true not just of those countries with China, but even between uh, Japan and Korea. Uh, and that's actually one of the factors that the Chinese don't write very much about, but in reality, they have zero control over. China can have a perfect relationship with Seoul and a perfect relationship uh, with Tokyo, which is hard to imagine, but they could theoretically have such. Uh, and the CJK and FDA could still hinder on the fact that Seoul and Tokyo could have problems. Uh, so this is a three-way bargaining game, and Beijing only has access to two of those uh, legs of the triangle. Third, they say, well, there are historical and territorial issues that divide the countries. Uh, I've written elsewhere about the tensions between um, Beijing and Seoul over historical and territorial issues. I think much more substantially the division right now is between uh, Beijing and Tokyo, and most notably over the Senkakus, but also over history issues. And again, history issues, territorial issues also divide Tokyo and Seoul, whether it's Tokyo Takeshima or the issue of sexual slavery. Uh, these are issues that will also potentially inhibit any uh, forward motion on a CJK FDA. Uh, fourth, they'll say, well, you know, the Japanese really still view themselves as leaders of Asia. Um, you know, traditionally, political international political economists have written about Japan's view of being that of a, you know, a flock of geese, or with the Japanese in the leading role, and the South Koreans, the Taiwanese, the Singaporeans, Hong Kong, uh, as kind of the trailers, and then further back, you know, some of the Southeast Asian countries, China. Uh, and the Chinese really view Japan as kind of still trying to hold on to, or still harboring, or having a hard time letting go of that model where Japan is the natural leader of East Asia. Uh, and the Chinese don't like that. Um, and view that as uh, one of the reasons why Tokyo won't come and play ball. Um, and finally, they often blame U.S. obstructionism. They never really specify what, what the U.S. Uh, is doing to obstruct this or how, uh, but the implication seems to be that, well, you, of course, the TPP is an, is an effort to obstruct CJK, 
uh, FT, uh, CJK FTA, but also there are vague hints that maybe Washington is pushing Tokyo to resist this, or maybe Washington is encouraging Seoul not to move ahead with this. Um, but the overall implication of all of these five uh, complaints, if you will, is not that any of the fault lies with China. Uh, of course, anything you're going to read in the Chinese media uh, is going to be produced in an environment where if it's very formal, uh, it's very unlikely to be very critical of China because it will be published. Um, many of the scholars in Beijing have a hard time, I, in my personal experience, speaking or writing publicly about uh, it from a perspective that's highly critical of the government. Um, and so in some sense, we may have a bit of a, uh, a bias just by the selection of the sources. If you were to talk to these individual analysts uh, face to face, you might hear that they'd be more willing to acknowledge that some of the problems with moving forward may stem from China's foreign policy approach or that China's uh, demands in the negotiations might be a problem. Uh, but in the official writings and in the academic policy think tank writings that you can get access to without actually going and interviewing, which I unfortunately didn't have a budget for and didn't have time to do, what you hear is basically an explanation that faults the outside or puts the blame on, uh, on the outside. Uh, so then looking ahead, where, where is this heading? Uh, quite clearly, uh, you have the first picture in 2009, uh, you know, Korea's at the center, Japan and China are all happy to shake hands, uh, and then you get in 2012 a very uh, staid and stoic looking set of leaders, now I would know all, all left and departed the scene, um, but really maritime and history issues have, have really eviscerated any hope, in my view, of, of any sort of a quick completion of this deal. Uh, <clears throat> And PRC analysts are increasingly uh, viewing this as something that's going to take a long time. Um, they view the TPP as a threat, as I've already said, and they now view uh, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's decision to push ahead with TPP as evidence that there's a, there is a, um, a U.S.-Japan plot uh, to block the CJKFTA or block China's rise economically. Um, and the, although traditionally analysts in the Chinese uh, sphere of, of thinking about this have tended to say, well, it's inevitable. Uh, I think Professor Cargo mentioned, well, you've got this very natural knitting together of the region's economy. It's extremely impressive. Uh, yep, uh, it's extremely impressive. Uh, and it appears to be kind of proceeding apace. Uh, traditionally, that had meant that Chinese analysts said, oh, it's inevitable that you know, even if we would hit some bumps in the road and we have got to deal with the Senkakus or this and that crisis, but in the long run, it makes so much logical sense that it will eventually happen. So they did, traditionally were pretty calm about this, but I think increasingly they're beginning to say, well, wait a minute, actually some of the problems we're confronting might be lengthening our timelines. Um, trilateral working level talks concluded earlier this year. Uh, political level negotiations, i.e. leadership level negotiations, people who are not just saying, well, here's what we want. this is my final slide, so I will allow you to keep that there, Dr. Cargill. Um, say, in essence, uh, you know, basically China's geoeconomic strategy is bumping against its foreign and security policy strategy. Uh, earlier I used the language of kind of offensive and defensive realism. Prospect theory might help us to understand this a bit. China's economic strategy of trying to center influence uh, on Beijing is, in a sense, trying to get, trying to play for a gain. Uh, but psychological theory suggests people are much more risk averse to losses than they are willing to accept risk in order to gain something. Um, and so that could potentially explain why China is pushing so much harder on uh, issues of territorial dispute, because that's really about legitimacy, it's about resources, uh, and it's about the survival of the Chinese Communist Party. Whereas gaining something from trade, you know, okay, we don't have it, but we'll get along without it, that's okay. Uh, the rising tensions in the region also make China's traditional argument that our rising tide will lift all economic boats look a lot more threatening when Beijing behavior makes it look like the stronger China gets, the more likely it is to, to gin up historical controversy with you and pick fights and twist your arm and you'll be weaker than, uh, than you were at the time when you could have said no before. Uh, finally, Japan's uh, decision to push ahead with TPP, I think, is likely to mean that you know all of the focus in Tokyo is likely to be on achieving this. The likelihood that Tokyo is going to be able to say, yeah, in the same time period with prime ministers who usually last 10 months, a year at most, 
uh, you know, will be able to push for TPP, RCEP, and CJK uh, makes it seem unlikely to be. So that's where I'm finishing, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Uh, is this working? Is this working? Um, we'll just have each paper presented and then the discussion afterwards. Uh, right, Chung Lee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased and honored uh, to be here uh, showing uh, the panel with affording me the uh, uh, eminent uh, scholars and have a chance to uh, share my view uh, in front of a uh, uh, very uh, distinguished audience. Uh, I think I will differ slightly from uh, other speakers, because uh, I, I think I'm I'm the only insider you know, in terms of CJKMT. Uh, I've been involved uh, in the process from the beginning, so uh, and I'm from Korea, so uh, I uh, so I spent a little bit more time on the kind of uh, the, the the overall uh, picture of uh, CJKMT. Uh, then, of course, uh, our uh, highlight the kind of prospects uh, of CJKFTA and others and from the uh, Korean perspective. So, just brief look at the uh, economic ties uh, between China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, here you can see the, the inter regional dependency uh, of uh, uh, trade. Uh, for uh, Korea's in terms of e uh, export and import, uh, you know the blue line indicates the interregional trade. So uh, you know you can see that uh, the the share uh, uh, has been uh, has risen uh, quite rapidly uh, both in, uh, in export and import, and in uh, 2011. Uh, the level of inter-regional uh, 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 trade, both in, uh, export and import, uh, amounted to about uh, 30%. And Japan's situation is quite similar to uh, that of Korea. Uh, although, uh, uh, in terms of absolute level, uh, Japan's uh, uh, level of uh, interregional dependency is a little bit uh, lower, but you can see, uh, it, you know, over the 20 uh, past 20 years, uh, the share has risen quite substantially in Japan. And in contrast to uh, Korea and uh, Japan, as you can see, uh, for China, the share of uh, Northeast Asia in uh, China's export uh, market is, you know, uh, quite low, relatively low, and uh, continue to diminish uh, since mid-1990s. Uh, However, when you look at the uh, import side, uh, China continues to depend on this import uh, from uh, Northeast Asian neighbors. Now let me turn to the uh, a decade of preparation for CJKFTA. Uh, as you may know, the, in uh, November 1999, uh, the leaders of China, Japan, and Korea uh, got together for the first time, and they agreed uh, on uh, a res uh, joint research to enact uh, economic cooperation among the three countries. Uh, accordingly, uh, the DRC of China and NIA, uh, later uh, ID Jetro, and uh, Kia uh, began uh, trilateral joint research in November of 2000. Then, uh, since 2003, uh, three uh, institutions uh, conducted uh, joint research 
uh, on Studio KFTA. Uh, actually, at that time, the uh, Japanese government was reluctant, uh, so we had to kind of tone down the, 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 the topic uh, to economic effects of a possible FTA between China, Japan, and Korea. Then, uh, in uh, so we we have conducted uh, joint research on CPKFTA uh, for seven years. Actually, we when we started, uh, we had uh, we, we thought that we could uh, uh, finish within three or four years, but uh, the governments were not ready uh, to upgrade. Uh, to uh, official tripartite tr joint study. At the same time, uh, they didn't, didn't want to, you know, uh, to stop the the, uh, the joint research on the CJKFTA for for fear of losing the momentum of CJKFTA. So we continued uh, for uh, seven years, and in two thousand nine, the uh, trial to do the research recommended finally uh, upgrading of uh, the uh, joint research as uh, UKFTA uh, to uh, discussions among uh, government officials. Then there was another upgrade, upgrade of uh, uh, trial to submit meeting. Uh, apart from the uh, trial to submit meeting uh, under the framework of ASEAN Plus 3, uh, the first independent trilateral summit uh, was held uh, in December 2008 in Fukuoka. Then the leaders agreed to launch an official tripartite uh, joint study for CJKFTA at the second uh, trilateral uh, summit uh, meeting uh, in Beijing in October 2009. And uh, seven uh, meetings were held uh, uh, between uh, May 2010 and uh, December uh, 2011. Uh, first meeting was held in Seoul, and the, the seventh and the last uh, meeting was held in Pyeongchang, uh, Korea. And the Joint uh, Study Committee examined basically the coverage of possible uh, CJK FTA and agreed on uh, guiding principles of the CJK FTA negotiation. Actually, it was very practical. Although, uh, it uh, recommended that the uh, CJK FTA should uh, be comprehensive and high-level FTA, but at the same time, uh, uh, they said that each, I mean, the, the FTA negotiation uh, should uh, uh, should be conducted uh, with uh, due consideration uh, to sensitive sectors in each country. And the outcome of the uh, joint study was reported to the uh, Economic and the Trade Ministers uh, meeting uh, and the uh, trilateral uh, summit uh, in Beijing in May 2012, uh, uh, last year. And the leader service agreed at the meeting that trilateral FTA negotiation would be launched in uh, 2012. And finally, in Phnom Penh, uh, on uh, November 20th last year, the trade ministers of the three countries announced the launch of the uh, CJKFT negotiations. So what was the Korea's role? Uh, trilateral joint research was uh, first proposed by the Kim, President Kim Dae-jung during the first uh, gathering of uh, leaders in uh, uh, November 1999, and another thing is uh, I'd like to you know rectify the com uh, commonly uh, held view that uh, it was China uh, that proposed uh, the CJKFTA study. Actually, what happened was uh, we agreed among the researchers uh, to choose a topic of CJKFTA, and since. Uh, China was the host of uh, uh, the joint research as well as the summit meeting. So it, it was the role of uh, Premier Zhu Rongji 
uh, to uh, raise the issue. So, you know, it, it was right that Jerome raised the issue, but not because of, it was Chinese idea, but it was agreed among the uh, researchers. And it was actually the Korean team uh, that proposed originally uh, the CJKT as a research topic. And during the uh, official tripartite joint uh, study, uh, France I played kind of intermediary role between China and Japan. And now let me turn to uh, kind of supporting factors uh, for the uh, CJKT. First, as you know, all three countries have concluded about uh, many, you know, uh, FTAs, about 10 FTAs each country. As for uh, South Korea, uh, eight FTAs with 45 countries, including the United States and the EU, uh, in effect. So for South Korea, having concluded many FTAs, two neighboring countries which have pursued also relatively active FTA policy seem to be natural partners with which uh, to form a regional uh, trade agreement. Since Korea won be a uh, global FTA hub, uh, Korea has to uh, form some kind of FTA with China and Japan. Be trilateral FTA to bilateral FTAs or de facto FTA within the RCEP or probably the combination of these. Secondly, as you can see in this picture, uh, interregional trade dependency between China, Japan, and Korea has increased for uh, Korea, indicated in blue line, and Japan, you know, the, the greenish uh, line. However, you know, China, Chinese uh, tendency is quite different. So, although China has been kind of relatively active in uh, pursuing uh, CJKFTA. When you look at this uh, figure, uh, it seems to me that it would be more rational for both uh, South Korea and Japan uh, to be more active uh, in pursuing uh, CJKFTA. So there are many other uh, supporting factors, you know, like you know, strong manufacturing sectors. Uh, actually, as you know, the, it, all three countries are uh, strong manufacturing uh, countries. So uh, FTA, an FTA uh, could be uh, concluded among the uh, three uh, strong manufacturing uh, countries. Uh, it could uh, further raise uh, the uh, competitiveness of the uh, manufacturing sector uh, in those uh, countries. Uh, on the other hand, all three countries have relatively weak uh, service sectors. So uh, an FTA among three countries uh, could uh, contribute to raising competitiveness uh, by further liberalizing uh, those sectors. Another uh, key issue is the regional FTA uh, in East Asia. All three countries are supporting uh, regional FTA in East Asia. But in order to achieve a regional FTA, an FTA or FTAs, regardless of type, including the CJK FTA, would have been needed among the three countries. Then the global financial crisis and European uh, sovereign debt crisis uh, provided an, an additional uh, rationale for both the CJK FTA and RCEP, in my view. Because uh, considering the you know, economic difficulties of the United States and the EU, uh, North East Asian countries or uh, East Asian countries as a whole uh, should uh, enlarge a uh, regional market. Then, trilateral summit. As I, I said earlier, uh, trilateral summit uh, has been instrumental in advancing the uh, CJKT. In my view, uh, the role of, of uh, the trilateral uh, summit 
uh, will be crucial uh, for uh, finalizing the CJKFT as well. Then let me turn to the uh, risk factors uh, for the CJKFT. Uh, as other FTAs, the CJKFTA is likely to be uh, to face uh, strong opposition uh, from those related to uh, sensitive sectors in each country, especially uh, in Korea and Japan. And geographic proximity among the three countries uh, in this regard could further intensify sensitivity uh, for industries like agriculture and fisheries. Uh, for Korea, uh, most uh, sensitive uh, sectors would uh, be related to the trading goods, not services or investments, but trading goods. And the sensitive sectors uh, vis a vis uh, China would be quite different from uh, those uh, vis a vis Japan. Of course, uh, vis a vis China, agriculture, fisheries, and some manufacturing uh, sectors uh, would be uh, sensitive sectors. While as for Japan, uh, oil industry and machinery uh, could be regarded as sensitive. But uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, it's domestic politics related to the past history and nationalism is a real uh, risk factor. And recent uh, territorial disputes uh, have aggravated the situation and uh, become the, a serious uh, risk factor uh, that could hinder the realization of the SDGKTA. So one may argue at this juncture, uh, it, it is still unrealistic uh, for the three countries to start the CJKFTA negotiation uh, right now, even after 10 years of preparation, as uh, they are still struggling to surmount historical uh, legacies. Or maybe it's time to start the process of uh, overcoming the past history by reversing the way of thinking. In my view, the trilateral FTA could actually serve as the first step toward reducing regional tension and overcoming past history. Of course, uh, okay. uh, South Korea's role in this regard uh, is important because most uh, visible rivalry uh, being uh, between China and Japan, uh, Korea uh, could serve as an intermediary. And given the divide, uh, Korean Peninsula and North Korea being the uh, center of the regional security tension, South Korea could uh, benefit the most uh, from easing tensions in Northeast Asia. Therefore, it sh uh, South Korea should be more active in advancing the CJKFTA. Okay, so let me finally talk about the prospects uh, for CJKFTA and other FTAs from the Korean perspective. Okay, there are two bilateral FTAs and Four rounds of uh, negotiation uh, have been held uh, for uh, Korea, China, Japan FTA, uh, but uh, the re result of the Korea, Japan FTA negotiation has yet to be announced. In addition, our Korean our government is fully committed to uh, the starting uh, negotiation of the CJK FTA and the RCEP. So, as far as CJKFT is concerned, the Korean government has to pursue both indirect way uh, via uh, Korea-China FTA and also direct path uh, to the uh, trilateral FTA. And the relation, when it comes to relationship with, uh, between uh, CJKFT and RSF, uh, given all three countries uh, are uh, also involved in the RCEP, uh, CJKFT and the RCEP are closely linked to each other. So, 
CPKFT could facilitate RSAP, and RSAP also could uh, facilitate a CPKFT. As for the TPP, Korea is currently not uh, overly uh, interested. First, uh, Korea has already concluded the FTA with the United States and other uh, participating countries or uh, negotiating uh, with participating countries. Uh, second, Korea, Korea has so many uh, FTAs uh, you know, right now. I mean, Korea-China FTAs are on the way, and Korea government completed already uh, CDKFT and RCEP negotiations. So at this juncture, uh, the likely order of priority uh, for Korea could be Korea-China FTA, followed by CDKFTA, the RCEP, and TPP. But having said that, it is difficult to predict the order of conclusion of this FTA because there are so many variables. Uh, let me just stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next paper is by Claude uh, Barfield. I'm on the sit. That's okay. Pardon? I'm on the sit. That's great. Uh, from the U.S. perspective. Uh, thank you very much. I just have to reach further, though, with the card. That's so it will become more obvious. <laughs> uh, thank AEI and thank you all for patience with us. Um, I missed an email for you about six weeks or two months ago and didn't realize that he had actually replied uh, or given me some comments. And I've been waiting and thinking, well, it'll have to at some point, or maybe it's in my mind. But anyway, we got, we got it in. Uh, I'll have to say at the beginning, I have, I have a problem. I hope I've overcome the paper. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, I don't think there's been a lot of thinking about the CJK. So uh, what, I try, what I've tried to do in the paper is to give a broader view of the U.S. approach to uh, free trade agreements and the U.S. approach to Asia and the combination of uh, economics and security. And talk in the CJK, as I actually think, despite some disagreement with the, with the perspective of the Korean paper, I look at CJK, it seems to me that whatever the United States thinks, it's, it's not, it's something, it's an entity which will be on its way to something else. Either it will evolve, it will be just a part of the reset, the, the intra Asian regional agreement, or it will be it'll be part of another, going on in some other, in, in some other direction of uh, ultimately China joining, uh, Japan first, and Korea, China joining uh, the, the U.S. mission in the CPP. Uh, having said that, let me, let me then look at you, I was trying to just to look at the papers, see the papers yet. What I try to do is to go back, I'm not going to spend all the time in history here, but I do want to uh, show continuity in U.S. policy that does, I think, ultimately impact the CJK and the DPP and, the, and our reaction to RCEP. And basically, let me make three points before, you, before I get into the details. And one, I think from the beginning, the point that I will make and go through a couple of administrations is that from the time that the United States moved away from multilateralism as its chief and the only trade policy from 1945 to the late 1980s, uh, inevitably, economic goals were intertwined with security and diplomatic goals. And that was true all through, I think it's been through, through very different administrations since 1990. Uh, secondly, uh, we have this, and I'll spend more time for this, we have this strange situation that in the current administration, the Obama administration, we've gone from an administration which for its first three years did not really want to have a trade policy, to the potential of the second Obama administration, uh, for the most, uh, it may not be fruitful, but the most ambitious trade policy that we've had in the United States embark on since the 1990s. I mean, the administration now has the TPP. They have just agreed, I think, mistakenly, at least for the short term, to go forward with the USEU. They are pushing a services agreement in the WTO. They're pushing an information and technology agreement in the WTO. I mean, I sense NAFTA, WTO, APEC, under, under the Bush slash Clinton administrations of the early 90s, and we had this. And third, thirdly, I think interestingly, swing quickly back out to, to, to Asia, over the last year, or certainly the last six months, I think the, the contours of the potential options are much clearer. 
in terms of the regional economic architecture. I mean, until you had the reset uh, launching in December, the TPP was the only thing on the table. Uh, you now have had, I, I'm going to have some skepticism about, you now have the alternative of CJK. That it's really, the Chinese are pushing, I think, largely as a result. I agree very much with what Mr. Harrell said. Uh, it very much is a reaction to, to the TPP. So that you really, I think, and another point that I will make at the end, I think we will know where the TPP is in the next year and a half. It will either succeed or fail over, at some point in the next year, sometime as early as mid-2014, we'll know. And then you'll know what the, what the alternatives there are. All right, let me let me then go back a bit to the to the, the first point that I made. I think it's it's sometimes overused, but I do think symbolically to to, to sort of sum up the way the United States has approached trade policy in terms of bilateral regional grants, go back internally in terms of Asia to, to uh, Secretary Baker's Secretary James Baker's Bush point. Uh, in reaction to Prime Minister Mai here's the push for an intra-Asia uh, regional arrangement, but Baker said that the United States will not allow a line to be drawn down the middle of the Pacific with the United States on one side and the Asians on the other. And Baker, from his memoirs later, he said, what well, he did not, well, he did not see that there was a security problem for the United States at the time. He saw this in terms of the projection of diplomatic and security power as well as economic power. And I would argue that Administrations that are very different, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, have in, in, in ended up, whether they have said it or not, uh, following really the, that same uh, that same conjunction of, of interests. Uh, I'm not going to spend time with the uh, with the, uh, with the Bush administration or the Clinton administration. To say that Clinton just did pick this up. Clinton faced a situation where you got a kind of unipolar moment uh, in the mid 1990s, so that. Well, security was not a big deal, certainly not in Asia at the time. Uh, Japan was in decline, was beginning to decline. China had not uh, risen at that point. But the Clinton administration did stress in terms of APEC and in terms of the bilaterals that were pushed late the administration, the political issues as well as economic issues. It's with the Bush administration, actually, interestingly enough, and I mention this because Bush and Obama are supposedly polar opposites in so many things, but in this case, I think there's real clarity. So the Bush administration, you actually had a formal uh, set of, of papers or principles laid out publicly by the administration linking the two things, so that is the, the economic thinking and the diplomatic and security. I mean, Bush and uh, Zelig, the secretary of the USTR, basically pushed on the one hand, so also back to globalization. The argument was, this is in terms of bilateral that unlike if there was a lot of disagreement among Congress, my friend Jagdish Bhagwati still gets really pissed off at me when I when I when I follow this line. But, but Zelik argued that you could build a global free trade not just through the WTO or the GATT at the time, but through bilateral and then trilateral and then regional and then agreements and then, and then to a to global free trade. <clears throat> so competitive liberalization became a part of the, of the US lexicon. And at the same time, the Bush administration, uh, in the wake of 2011, directly linked in policy statements our trade policy with larger security and diplomatic goals. And as a matter of fact, they, they followed this through in terms of choice of, of FTA partners. Australia was put to, to the head of the line because of its support in Iraq. And New Zealand was put to the back of the line or said that don't, you know, don't come to us with this. Not so much because of, of Iraq, well, that was a piece of it. But also because of the nuclear, nuclear policy, where we could not have our ships in the, in the harbors. <laughs> and if you look at the 17 agreements that, that, Bush, that Bush made in, in those eight years, um, at least a third of them were purely on, uh, I would say, diplomatic or security grounds or political grounds. Morocco over Bahrain. Uh, Korea, interestingly enough, is where you get the exact combination. And I'll come back to that with, when we come to Obama. Now, Moving on to the Obama administration quickly, um, <coughs> there were, with the Obama administration when they came into office, it was it was certainly unlikely. And I said, as I said earlier, it, it actually worked out this way that you would really have a four great forward movement uh, in trade policy in the United States. Obama had famously said, "Opposed NAFTA." He famously during the campaign said proudly 
that he would propose the FDA's uh, that Bush, that Bush had negotiated. He had a party divided under him. And indeed, I think, and to be fair to them, by the way, there was something else in the thing there, and that is the great recession we had in four, de four decades at the time. So they had other things on their mind. But what was interesting, what, if you're looking back, uh, was that as Baker, as it were, had predicted, Obama turned, I think, to trade policy, really, ultimately, as a function of, the, of his felt necessity or the, of his administration, what was going on out here in, or out in Asia. And that is, uh, when Obama came to office, was, you had the first eruption by North Korea with the nuclear test. You had them lobbing uh, missiles across the short-range missiles. So that there was a lot of pressure under, under, uh, on Korea and the administration felt that it had to do something to signal support. Beyond that, the administration had made a very good deal in its first year and throughout the entire time of the pivot to Asia. And, and Secretary of State Clinton, by the way, is a kind of bookend to Baker. Uh, as Baker took the lead, uh, so Clinton, I think, took the lead, going to all kinds of reasons for that. I think she, she inherited it because her, uh, the administration was involved with other things. This is a White House, and I'll come back to this. Uh, Mr. Obama likes to keep control at the center. So a lot of his head of people have not had have, have not have a lot of authority. And in many ways, she did not. But she did have a lot of authority, as it turned out, in Asia. And she was the one who, I think, took the lead. Now, however, it was the president, finally, who, when he came to Asia in 2009, and the subsequent church really made the key connection, kept coming back to the fact that the pivot uh, was both an economic and a military and security projection. This whole point about this, and we are all in. Ironically, the TPP, the Transfer of Partnership Agreement, had been something they had inherited, the administration had inherited from the Bush administration. <coughs> and <coughs> moving on quickly, I'll just say, we'll talk about this later, it's inconceivable to me that had the TPP not been started under Bush, it would have ever been started under, under Obama. But the problem they faced was, as with Korea, was that if you're saying you're going to pivot to Asia, and you're saying that you know we're, this is where our resources are going to go, it was very difficult. Would, would have been very difficult for them to then turn away from this inherited agreement. And so, really, what you had, I think, it, 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 you know, at least I would argue, is not to say that there were not economic reasons. Uh, certainly, in terms of what was happening in Asia, in terms of the, you know, the economic, potential economic future, uh, and also uh, the, the Bush Council of Economic Advisors. Kind of, uh, the, Obama Council of Human Advice convinced him that you really, one way things in 1990 and 1910 were not going that well for them in terms of domestic growth, that one way to, to move for greater growth would be through exports. And so they were tied. And that, I think, was a fairly foolish thing to do, to think, as a matter of fact, in terms of what was your ability to control exports. But they, they were convinced of it. So this then was the situation that we just bring this up to date, that, that you've got the TPP, they pushed it hard. TPP has now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but just to bring us just in the context of the reset, the CJK, and other things, it's had 16 rounds of negotiations. Uh, as you probably know, there's been a lot written about it, certainly in the last six months and last year. Uh, its aim is really for a what the, the members of the TPP call a 21st century agreement. And that most of the art, well, most of the detailed negotiations are things inside the board. It is to change the rules of regulation. It is to change the rules of health and safety kinds of things. Because the tariffs among the countries are to the exception of agriculture are not that important. And so it is a kind of new model. We can talk later about whether it its chances of, of success, but it is a it, it is a new it is a, it's put forward as a new model. Now let me bring that back, uh, finally, to where things are in terms of what has this been with the CJK, with, uh, with the reset, and with uh, China, and I mean, with Korea, and Japan, and, and also China. Uh, I'll spend more of my time with Korea and Japan. One, I think um, we're in a situation where, uh, as I said in my introductory remarks, the administration, the TPP negotiators have gone to three years, and it's been, I forget how many, it's been eight or nine, it's been 16, as I said. So you had four, five, six in, in, in negotiating sessions each year. There are now two, you had two, there are two more. 
They have gone past one uh, deadline to set for themselves informally in the last, last November. I think that what we've come to the point where all of the technical details, I think, pretty much are done in the TPP. But there are a whole series, probably as much as a dozen, <coughs> political decisions that will have to be made by the, by the, by the political leaders <coughs> of the countries. <coughs> and so I think the situation is that if that they will either succeed or fail, I think, by the end of this year or sometime in the spring of 2014. Because I think there is something else looming over their shoulders, and that is the whole Doha phenomenon. That is, that you've bitten off more than you can chew. Doha has gone on for over a decade. And Dr. Lee said in passing to me, I don't understand the TPP. How do they think they can do this? That may be true. We can get into that in the discussion. But that's where that stands. The reset, the, the alternative, I think, is going to take a much longer time. There have been discussions in Washington that somehow these are these are in competition. I think there won't be competition. Either, there, either the TPP will succeed or fail, and then you will have, I think, that our reset will not be uh, if in competition. If the TPP fails, then the reset, I think, will become the most important uh, and probably the, the leading, uh, the, the obvious uh, choice uh, for an economic group. For, for, as an institution for the economic government. And that brings you finally then to Japan and Korea. Um, the, Abe's decision, uh, really, I do, whatever happens, whether, the, whether, the, whether it works out or not in coming in or the TPP, I think did upend things. I, mean, I think it's the reason that the, that the Chinese, and I defer to you, uh, with Carol on this, they really, I mean, they were pushing it anyway, but they have really stepped up pushing to get to get the CJK uh, going and really moving. And it will be interesting to see how much they are willing to submerge the, uh, I've got this in the paper and I can spend any time with, submerge actually the, the real political tensions and the deep geopolitical tensions to get this forward. I think that has changed things in terms of the, Now, for Japan itself, um, it's they're great benefit from, from the United this is from the United States perspective. I have argued in, in, in other papers in, in, in Washington that we, and I'm not sure that this is getting through to Congress, we'll see what happens in terms of Japan. That it was great to have Canada and Mexico come in last year. But for the TPP to have real heft in Asia, you have got to have Japan and Korea. One or the other, and preferably Japan and Korea, but certainly uh, Korea or, or, or Japan. And I think what Japan's decision to come in has really, if it succeeds, has really tipped the balance in terms of an economic architecture toward the TPP. With, with all the caveats. I mean, that that is really the key, in, I think, in my mind, at least, the major decision. And then finally, the question of, of, of Korea. This was a the presentation that we, that we just had in the paper is a splendid paper. But, what, what, but the difference in perspective is that this was a paper that was, that, that, and I think this, by the way, is the view of, of the, the Korean government. I've argued this would take a lot <laughs> at times. The former trade minister, just that trade minister of Korea. To look, at, to look at this just in terms of the economics, as the paper did, is to miss the larger questions that I've heard. You, the United States can't look at this in terms of just the economics, so that's important. And I think no nation, when you go for this society trade policy, can go forward with this uh, and, the, and with just looking at the blindness of economics. Korea has to think of it in terms of keeping the United States there. I think, and I defer to the who knows a lot more about this than I do, but I've been told that Abi. Despite the fact that he has a, a, a large, you know, a big economic agenda, what is really, he really is most concerned about the US Japanese alliance. And the TPP, while, while it will have major implications for his economic reforms, is also a way of keeping the United States there. And so I think that's the key. I think also to go back then to Korea, I think from the United States point of view, Koreans must, must decide you know, when and how they come in. I think that the irony is that, as uh, we, we talked about earlier, I think if you, 
the TPP is going to be the core, the U.S. Korea agreement, plus or minus. Some things will be more liberal, some things will be less liberal. So there's no economic reason for Korea not to just come into the TPP. It could do so without any economic adjustment. The question is the political one, I think. Uh, and so I think, really, it's, it's up to the Koreans to decide. I'll be interested to see, we can talk about this in the discussion. From a really economic, economic point of view, with the CJK not going too far, with Korea coming into the TPP, it seems to me there are economic reasons for, 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 for Japan coming into the TPP, there are economic reasons for Korea coming in. But we'll just have to see that place. So I think I'll just leave it with Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. okay. Just a, a brief word of explanation. Um, the KAS and its wisdom allows you to be on only one panel, and I had already been signed up for a panel uh, prior to committing to this, so I'm not officially here. But, uh, <laughs> so I, don't, I don't get an name tag, and uh, I'm sure my department chair will hold up my races uh, <laughs> as I sign up here in the program. Uh, my paper, my paper picks up a lot of the threads uh, in the earlier papers. Essentially, it starts with the uh, very logical contention that East Asia, and from a Japanese perspective, Japan, has become increasingly involved economically with the rest of Asia. To make a long story moderately short, Japan has become much more increasing, much more dependent upon Asia for its uh, exports and its overall trade. Uh, than the United States, whereas the United States had traditionally been Japan's major trading partner as well as its major security partner. So economic integration has been sweeping across East Asia, particularly Northeast Asia, we've seen some data on that as well. Secondly, there has been a uh, substantial rise in the degree of intra-Asian institutionalization. That includes, of course, uh, the CJ, CJK trilateral arrangements, about which I'll say something in a minute or two. But it also includes a host of activities, uh, essentially starting with ASEAN, but including the ASEAN Plus Three, the Chiang Mai Initiative, the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization, et cetera, et cetera. So in all of these things, Japan, as well as China and Korea, have been very actively involved. All three countries essentially share a growing economic interest Dependence with one another as well as with Asia writ large, and simultaneously they are uh, deepening their institutional connections with one another, uh, again, with one another specifically as well as with Asia at large. And finally, uh, just to put uh, another cap on it, there has been a rise in the free trade agreements that have been signed by Korea, of course. China, as well as by Japan. So all three of them have moved in those directions. Now, I think of a point that uh, uh, Claude Barfield just made. From the Japanese perspective, any question about how to deal with a trilateral CJK FTA is going to hinge as well on the deteriorating security conditions among the three countries. Uh, Japan, as everybody knows, has had an ongoing dispute over the Senkaku Daoyu Islands with China. It has also had uh, a problem with South Korea over the Dokto Takashima Island uh, group. And uh, in addition to that, Japan has been very much enmeshed in an awful lot of intra-country nationalism that has been uh, involved in denying a great deal of the World War II history of Japan's involvement with colonizing Korea, uh, sexual slavery, uh, aggression in China, et cetera, et cetera. So the security relations among these three countries have, in fact, been uh, rather negative, uh, particularly over the last several years. So the way I try to structure the paper is to say that the Japanese leadership essentially involves itself uh, in seeing a complex and contradictory set of relations with China and South Korea to try to figure out whether it wants to opt for enhancing its economic interdependence and multilateral linkages uh, despite the security tensions in the hope that greater economic links will reduce the security tensions, or conversely, does it worry more about the rising security concerns and the possibility that increased economic ties will, in some respects, bolster China's position across the region at Japan's expense 
and possibly secondarily improve at least the economic position of South Korea at Japan's expense. So that I see as the, as the central tension uh, that involves the, the, uh, the three countries from the Japanese perspective. Now that being said, it's important to note that the trilateral meetings that have been going on uh, since 2008 have made very great progress. Uh, just recently, at the end of 2012, they, the three countries signed a common investment treaty which in fact makes uh, a great deal of commitment on the part of all three to reducing the barriers to cross-border investment and sets up a series of internal regimes that are common across all three countries. So in some respects, we already have a preliminary institutionalization of the economic links among the three countries that could provide the foretaste of a free trade agreement and of course the agreement to pursue the free, the free agreement that we've heard so much talk about comes as a logical sequence to the common investment treaty. That being said, it's important to note that Japan has the furthest to go economically in terms of the concessions that would have to be made in order to get to a free trade agreement status that would be even remotely equal to that of China or, or South Korea. Essentially, uh, China now has uh, about 25% of its exports covered by FTAs. Uh, South Korea, 28%. Uh, Japan has only 14%. So this, it seems to me, sets up a, a fundamental difficulty for Japan. And the, the way I set this up, I'll just extremely grieved by the domestic politics of this, although the paper spends a lot more time on it. My, my central focus with regard to Japan is to suggest that Japanese leadership, particularly in the wake of the 20 years of uh, or economic slowdown that Japan has confronted, has seen this both as an economic problem and a security problem. It makes Japan less relevant diplomatically, politically, economically, in the region, China has, of course, grown considerably and not insignificantly at all. South Korea has made a number of economic changes that, that boosted its economy, particularly in the wake of the Asian financial crisis of 1998, in ways that Japan finds particularly challenging economically, at least partly challenging diplomatically. So, the difficulty for Japan, as I see it, is how to, how to deal with the efforts to try and improve its relations with China and South Korea, while at the same time facing incredibly difficult domestic political conditions, the essence of which is that the long Liberal Democratic Party has had a very strong base in protection rather than in free trade. And I won't take you through the last 20 years or 50 years of Japanese politics, but in essence, the LDP has been very heavily dependent on protection of small and medium-sized businesses, of food industry, the distribution industry, agriculture, of course, and a host of other areas. And uh, this is politically critical with the Liberal Democratic Party. The LDP, in my view, went through an effort under Prime Minister Koizumi 2002 to 2006 to try to move away from that constituency. Koizumi made a number of efforts at reform, but successors, most fundamentally, then Prime Minister Abe, followed by Fukuda and then Asa, all essentially rolled back the kinds of openness and liberalization that he put in place. The end result of which is, you saw the rise of the DPJ coming into power for three years. The DPJ looking to open Japan's relations with Asia, to come to better terms with the history of World War II simultaneously, to uh, move away from some of the domestic protection. But the DPJ suffered from being governing three successive prime ministers who had his particular uh, set of misfortunes, and the end result of it was that the, the, uh, the DPJ did virtually nothing 
to improve relations between Japan and the rest of Asia, or to roll back uh, the protectionism that existed in Japan. So Abe comes in with his agenda, and uh, the essence of that seems to be his Abenomics, which I'm sure everybody has heard enough about, but three arrows or three prongs to this, one of which is uh, liberal monetary policy, uh, the other of which is increasing Japan's exports, and the third, all of which seems very fuzzy at this point, is domestic structural reform. And the question, critically, can Abe really make those structural reforms? Because Japan has been very slow to move them over the last 20 years, and the LDP is still critically dependent for votes on sectors like agriculture, construction, small business, and the like. So, uh, in essence, I see then Abe, Japanese government, facing a choice as to how to move forward on this whole issue of the uh, CJK FTA, but also the TPP and reset. And essentially, the paper tries to suggest that all three of these would require their victories to create FDI liberalization on the part of Japan, uh, and it would bring greater or lesser political pain for the government that pursued one over the other. But it would also be very critical in terms of the countries with which Japan would be aligning itself through whatever free trade agreements it moved forward. So, in essence, the trilateral arrangements with China and Korea are very beneficial in terms of the economics. Uh, it would be probably the second of the three in terms of the kinds of domestic demands it would make. China still has a number of protected areas, small and uh, I mean, state-owned enterprises, it has lots of regulation, etc. So coming to agreement with China on this would probably make fewer demands on Japan, and considering if South Korea were interested in moving the trilateral forward, they might be willing to make concessions on how they want to vis the China and Japan, and perhaps not as much as Korea itself might be prepared to uh, liberalize without, uh, without any economic difficulties at home. The difficulty, I think, from from uh, the standpoint of Korea is that uh, Japan and Korea had negotiations for a bilateral FTA for a number of years, and then these fell apart uh, when Japan basically decided that it could not move as far or as fast as Korea wanted. And so I think there's a certain measure of skepticism on the part of both China and Korea about whether Japan, if it negotiates or begins to negotiate on this trilateral FTA, will in fact be is the negotiating, or will in fact be trying to slow things down as much as possible to prevent the political pain at home that they would otherwise be facing. So this is the, this then sets up a, a, a kind of dilemma for the, the trilateral. On the one hand, given the high level of economic protection, uh, the demands for liberalization on the part of Japan would be relatively limited. And there's also the upside possibility that if Japan could enter into agreements with Korea and China, that they, this would help to soften some of the diplomatic friction among the three countries or between Japan and the other two. There are hints now that uh, the Chinese are doing their best to back off from the Senkaku value confrontation, to soften this and to move down the escalatory ladder at least in part in the hopes that Japan will find the trilateral arrangements interesting and will in fact prepare to move a bit away from the TPP. So that's my view on the trilateral. The, the TPP, on the other hand, would make the most excessive demands for change on Japan's part. As we heard before, this is not just a matter of tariffs, it's a matter of internal regulations, service sectors, uh, a whole host of things all of which would collectively be very painful politically for Japan to go through. But from the standpoint of Abe and the LDP, the virtue of TPP is, uh, quite obviously, it strengthens the bilateral relationship between Japan 
and the United States. And of course, Abe has managed to get at least a preliminary concession from Obama that nothing is a precondition to entering into the negotiations, which Abe has essentially translated into we'll be able to keep agriculture, agriculture moderately safe. Uh, you know, we've got lots of room to negotiate, but if uh, if uh, the American uh, presentation is one that's somewhat skeptical of how quickly people can move forward. I would be very suspicious about how quickly Japan is likely to uh, jump into the TPP and actually negotiate seriously with the hope of moving this forward. So if you think of Singapore or New Zealand uh, or even the United States on the one hand as anxiously pushing for lots of movement forward, uh, clearly the Japanese negotiators would be very slow to move forward. And so far they haven't even actually sat down at the table. So this is the most painful for Japan, but it does reinforce the ties bilaterally with the United States, and in particular, with Abe's nationalist credentials at stake, the thing he wants most, I think, is to have improved relations with the United States. And then finally, just a word or two on uh, RCEP, and that would be to suggest that this would probably, in many respects, be the easiest for Japan to deal with domestically, uh, and it would probably also be better, very beneficial because it the, essentially the membership of the East Asia Summit, the 16 countries, uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, APT, so it would be uh, something that Japan could, uh, could very quickly get behind, and uh, it would be potentially very large, but it would be potentially very low in its demands uh, for changes within Japan. So my view of this is that Japan's, Japan's leaders are essentially going to strategize about how to approach each of these because each one would have different levels of economic pain and would also put Japan in partnership with different combinations of countries. And so my, my concluding suggestion on this is that Japan really would have a very strong incentive to move forward on both the TPP and the trilateral at least because this would put Japan in a position to improve its diplomatic relations with two very critical economic partners in Northeast Asia, China and South Korea, while at the same time keeping positive relations with the United States and some of the democratic countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Chile, um, Singapore, et cetera, from Singapore, I want from Singapore to the word democracy, but, uh, uh, but with countries that would presumably be somewhat skeptical about China's uh, strategic moves within the rest of the region. So uh, from my standpoint, the Goldilocks strategy for Japan would be at a bare minimum to move forward both on TPP and on the trilateral MTA, but I'm somewhat warned by the um, by Scott's comment that uh, TPP has the possibility to suck all the air out of negotiations within Tokyo and it's very hard for me to believe that uh, Tokyo's government would be able to get behind simultaneously negotiating two separate agreements when the political uh, incentives are so strongly to resist moving forward on either of the two. So let me stop a minute. Thank you very much. We have uh, four papers that offer four country uh, perspectives on this issue. Uh, there was one thing I was asked to do as a moderator of the papers were presented, is to make a, a couple of comments on the papers. I, and I actually read them this afternoon <laughs> and uh, uh, learned quite a bit. It's not it's not my area, I mean, financial and monetary policy type stuff. Uh, but five things kind of came to mind, and there was some comments dealt with these issues. Uh, but I just want to throw this out. First of all. The, the CKK, it is liberalization among three countries, but also could, it's not really consistent with international liberalization. And that raises a whole bunch of issues uh, as to, even though there are economic advantages for the three countries, what exactly is the ultimate objective of this vis-a-vis -vis the United States, the Americas, and, and Europe? Uh, the second point, and, and TJ really emphasized this about that if you're going to have this kind of liberalization in these three countries, it's going to require structural change. And Japan is a real problem. 
It's now in its third decade of crisis. Uh, it has shown incredible resistance, and transitions is a kind word, uh, to structural reform. Um, and, but I would argue that I don't think China's that far behind. Uh, you know, it was only three decades ago that the only thing growing faster than Japanese GDP were books on Japan about how to eat everybody's lunch. And we have a tendency to look at China and just sort of project forward. But there are some really serious structural problems in their economy in terms of state-owned enterprises, uh, non-performing loans. Uh, and we, we don't really know the extent of the problem because of the tremendous non-transparency in this financial system. Japan have got a really pretty decent idea of what's going on. And Korea has got a pretty decent idea. Uh, so I wouldn't be so sanguine that China uh, may have some, some issues to deal with in that. And the third thing occurred to me was, I think something is really missing here from a financial perspective. Of course, that's my bias. But there's no discussion here about exchange rate objectives in every country. Uh, there's very little discussion. TJ did uh, pass on it about the activism of the, of the three central banks. Uh, the Bank of Japan, of course, has been in the news uh, with the recent change in management. And it's really quite remarkable what's going on and how the Bank of Japan is being directed to uh, continue uh, with quantitative easing with the real objective of appreciating the yen and trying to uh, engage in export stimulation. And I don't know if you're going to have liberalized trade in commodities and services. Uh, there is a financial aspect of that, and I think that's missing from this whole discussion. Uh, a fourth point that occurred to me about China and Japan, and who's leader and who's not. Korea, actually, I think is a success story here. I, I'm, not, no, I'm not near as bullish on China as a lot of people are, uh, because I see that non-performing loan problem accumulating in the financial system. Uh, but you know, you have to realize that China is an authoritarian government, and Japan is a functional democracy, and, and it's, it's, yet the history has Show it, 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 it yet has to be played out where the Chinese can really carry this off and allow sort of government directed markets and maintain that centralized authoritarian control. It remains to be seen. Uh, and the last point is North Korea, and Claude brought that up. I, I think this is really critical because this agreement is economic, but it's also political. And North Korea economically is unimportant. But it is a wild card in, for all three of those countries. And I think more attention needs to be paid to it and how politically it fits into this. Now, I'm an economist, so I, don't, I can't go much beyond that to point out that it's an issue. But anyway, those were five issues that sort of occurred to me as I was reading the papers. So I think we'll just open it up to discussion amongst the authors about each of their papers or questions from the audience. And so let's just keep this informal. Do any of the authors have something they want to say about that's somebody? Oh, okay. Well, thanks. Um, I'm Bob Sutter from George Washington University. Um, excellent presentation. It's really, it's a, I'm trying to sort it all out. It's a, it is very complicated, and I'm afraid I'm just going to add to the complication. Uh, we were having a panel. I'm on the on the fourth panel of the KEI panels uh, on Saturday morning. And there we talk about competition between the United States uh, and China. Uh, and we seem to be entering an era of more competitive U.S.-China relationships. You can argue, are we going to reach a very tense situation? I, I suspect not. But it will be more competitive. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so I, I think it, it showed up a bit in Scott's paper. But this, uh, and, and Claude, you alluded to it to some degree, but I think this, this idea that, that another dimension here, that all of this negotiation is taking place in an atmosphere of difficulties in a variety of ways. And it isn't just because Japan and China don't like each other. You have an overarching type of competitiveness between the two biggest powers in the world. And, uh, and I think that moves the dynamic in a certain direction. I, I think it might it has some impact on I can't say is it decisive or not, but it's, a, it's an element that I think probably deserves a bit more attention than, 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 than has been addressed up to this point. Sure. Start. 
Uh, um, yeah, actually, so, uh, I, Bob, I agree completely. Uh, I, I hope you found at least some of that in my comments, which reflect essentially the Chinese perspective on that. I, I actually thought uh, one of the things that I would like to say to Gil, as you look at the intro to this, is uh, listening to the four presentations, I think it's quite obvious that a, a panel that's only on a CJK FTA in some ways doesn't capture the whole picture because it's a part of a, a tripartite discussion together with TPP and RCEP to some extent. I think RCEP is a lot less consequential in, in the Chinese debate right now. At least. Uh, but I found myself, as I waded into this literature, uh, finding that I could disentangle these. It was very hard to talk about one without talking about the other two because the Chinese tend to see them as being very directly in competition. Um, and actually, then to build off of your question, Bob, I, I would like to ask um, uh, both Dr. Pempel and uh, Dr. Yi, if you could comment on um, Japan's and Korea's perception of risk in participating in TPP, is there an anxiety in Tokyo or in Seoul about joining TPP as it is perceived by Beijing as being a counter-China containment strategy? Because I didn't hear it, and especially in Dr. Yi, you know, Claude mentioned this, I would definitely say it's striking to an American observer to see the Korean discussion focus exclusively on this as if it's value neutral and just about enhancing efficiency. It makes me, frankly, extremely anxious because the Chinese don't view it that way. I don't think the reality is that way. And it seems almost naive to wade into this as if there's no consequences for the geostrategic relationship. Now, your papers may simply not have chosen to focus on that, but I wonder if you could enlighten us. How are the Greens thinking about managing the geostrategic risks, or at least the geostrategic implications of participating in CK FTA or CJK FTA, if it's being seen by Beijing as an opportunity to essentially divide that line down the Pacific that, that Claude talked about? Um, CJ, the same for your perspective. Is there a Japanese desire to avoid giving that impression to Beijing? Yeah. Okay, so I think, you know, Professor Kagil uh, talk about the, you know, the, it doesn't, I mean, CJKFTA or FTA issues uh, doesn't consider uh, financial uh, cooperation or from, you know, financial uh, factors. Actually, it's a trade agreement, you know, FTA is just you know, we have to have basic uh, uh, type of uh, just trade agreement. So I think these days, uh, I think FTA is a little bit uh, somehow, you know, overvalued. I think, you know, it, both in terms of uh, uh, cost and, it, and it, 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 in terms of the benefit. So basically, what we are doing when we uh, or oh, FTA is just uh, basically we lower the, the tariff barriers. Uh, usually we don't touch upon you know the uh, non-tariff barriers or basically tariff barriers. But still, especially in Asia, uh, unlike for example you know maybe with the exception of Singapore, uh, we don't really liberalize you know whole sectors. And I think in Korea is maybe you know more advanced you know, compared to uh, uh, Japan and uh, China because we managed to uh, conclude uh, FTA with both the United States and EU, uh, which uh, could be considered quite high level FTA. But uh, you know, neither China nor uh, Japan conclude any kind of serious FTA you know, in terms of a uh, uh, degree of liberalization. Okay, so that's one uh, point I'd like to make. I don't think it's the TPP. Okay, I, I'm an economist, I'm not political science, so uh, maybe I, I, I'm less sensitive. Uh, uh, and it's, it's normal, in my view. But, I mean, have it, I, I have been involved in the you know, CJKFTA or uh, we can write FTA in East Asia, ASEAN Plus 3, ASEAN 6 FTA, and all those, and even RCEP these days. Uh, 
But when you look at the uh, the major economic regions, I mean, East Asia or Northeast Asia, uh, are the only region uh, which doesn't have any kind of regional identity. And among the three Northeast Asian countries, uh, each country uh, composed, all three countries composed, you know, uh, more than 10 or, or around 10 FTAs with other countries, but not among them. No. So it's kind of abnormal situation in Northeast Asia. So I think it, it would be very difficult, I mean, it, it be to uh, tell the East Asian countries, no, you shouldn't form a regional identity. Why the EU, you know, is so advanced in terms of economic integration, and even in North America, you have not for, for a long time. So it's it's not real kind of trade block like EU. EU is a customs union. It started with a customs union, but FTA is an FTA. And especially, I mean, Korea, I feel uh, maybe, you know, we don't really, at least, uh, I don't uh, really uh, have a kind of, you know, any kind of pressure uh, with regard to the United States because we completely have to with the United States already. And we haven't completely had to with neither China nor uh, Japan. So I think, you know, after, as I said, after having completed FTAs with EU and uh, United States and other countries, I mean, Korea has only two important countries, of course, with Canada, but we are negotiating with Canada and Australia and those countries. Only two countries are left. So we have to form an FTA with you know, China and Japan you know, in, in some kind of FTA. Either, if not trilateral, then to bilateral. If we have, I think, problem with the uh, trilateral FTA, I think Korea will end uh, uh, maybe concluding uh, uh, two bilateral FTAs, you know, Korea, China, Korea, Japan. So, so another thing is, you know, for why? What I don't, I don't uh, like, you know, when some people talk about the FTA, I mean, TPP. I, I'm, I, I'm not a political scientist once again, but, you know, some, it could be considered as a kind of containment policy of China. I don't think, uh, as an economist, I don't think we have to contain the China like that, but we have to invade China. So, so. I think we should do some, you know, what the European did. Uh, instead of isolate, you know, Germany, uh, they tried to uh, build some kind of, you know, uh, economic community. So, but you know, we are not going that far. But FTA is a very, very, very basic uh, level of economic cooperation and, and, and in, in terms of uh, trade agreement. So, I don't think. Uh, I mean. When we uh, Korea form an FTA with China, uh, other countries could be upset because you know it's just China is the most important trading partner of Korea, so Korea has every right and every reason uh, to form FTA with China and with Japan as well. So, but I mean, if I just Say just one more uh, word. I mean, TPP. I think if United States kind of pushed uh, Korean government uh, to uh, join TPP, I think Korean government would join, but not because of the economic reason, but you know, uh, security reasons or whatever. But even, I mean, in terms of uh, economic benefits. Uh, of course, there will be some benefits, but it won't be that much. Uh, I make two short responses, and Scott will probably want to follow. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> just, uh, yeah. just be, I'll, I'll be I'll be very brief on Japan. I mean, I think I think this comes down essentially to a tension between uh, what you might think of as 
the business community versus the security community. Uh, the business community in Japan wants good economic relations with China and would be worried about any kind of implicit telegraphing of a message that says, we don't want good relations with China and we're joining TPP with the Americans because we're really interested in slowing China's growth. I mean, that would be the, that would be the, the sort of headline message or the Twitter message that, uh, that the business community would be sending to the, to the prime minister. But the flip side is that the security community in Japan is exceptionally worried about the so-called rise of China. Uh, and regardless of what you know, Tom says about all the implicit difficulties with China's long-term economic rise, the security folks don't see it that way. Even if they, even if they can run seven scenarios as to why China's growth rate is going to slow, they then translate it into security terms and say, but we still have a problem with security with China because they're going to get stronger and bigger and it's going to replace the United States. So, um, I mean, I think it's grossly oversimplified, but I think that's the internal tension in Japan. And so, right now, I see Abe siding primarily with the security community and essentially taking what you might think of as a not terribly pro China policy, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, uh, two comments with respect to what you said. Um, the, the reason I raised the issue about um, the perception of, of what the uh, CJK may be is that those three countries historically have had an export oriented development strategy. Uh, whereas much of the world, eh, it's, it's hard to you know, look at Europe and say it's export oriented, Canada's export oriented. The United States is export oriented, tend to be much more diversified economies. So that's why I brought that up. Because historically, Asian countries, especially China, Japan, and Korea, have adopted export oriented slash mercantilist approaches. Um, the second point you raised is you know, I agree with you. When you sat down, this was going to be a trade agreement for goods and maybe some services. That doesn't mean financial issues shouldn't be there. We just sat down and decided not to include them. But given the divergent exchange rate objectives and the different central bank behavior, that doesn't mean you, by definition, you ignore it. That was my point. So, some more questions? I was delighted to have exchange rates raised because I think it's one of the most important and most overlooked issues. Um, one of the problems in the U.S. government is compartmentalization. Um, USTR is responsible for trade negotiations. Uh, Treasury is responsible for financial matters, and um, and so basically they don't uh, they don't overlap. They don't bring the two halves together. Um, it would seem to me, though, as you as you pointed out, these are three countries which all had export uh, promotion policies, which involved their exchange rates. Um, there certainly must be some concern, whether it's expressed openly or expressed in private, there, there must be some concerns within these three countries about this issue. And I'm wondering um, what you all have picked up in, in that regard. Well, that was the reason I made that. It's my first one. So I'll, I'll just answer that. I mean, my, my focus in the, my paper was really on what the Chinese are saying. So I went to the, uh, the sources I consulted, quite honestly, did not mention uh, finance, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> exchange rate policy. Uh, it simply doesn't come up. Uh, so, you know, they, whatever they brought up, I tried to report to you all, and the paper tries to capture that. So, uh, it may simply be the case that Chinese uh, negotiators, or rather Chinese uh, analysts, are not thinking of it primarily in those terms. Uh, not that they shouldn't be. Um, but also, I would say Chinese analysts writing on trade. Uh, often don't know a whole lot about trade. Uh, and quite honestly, I mean, it, you know, it's it's very much the case that with a lot of these negotiations, they don't even know what the negotiations are about because the government tends to conduct them very very quietly and very much not in the public eye. Um, so uh, you know, that's purely speculation on my part, but uh, maybe we are to weigh in. Well, the problem is with trade policy in the U.S. currency. Obviously, there are lots of reasons the Chinese don't want to mention because everybody's beating on or has been for a long time. But it's going to be a nightmare 
because economists disagree. I mean, the, what what others have argued, and you're, you're the expert here, that the, the, our Federal Reserve policy, not in terms of financial stuff, the currency, the, the Brazilians and others have said, you know, it's, it's the Federal Reserve is the one who's keeping the U.S. So, but just by applying an easement, and what you need. That's true. So it's not inter, it's not direct intervention, but it's it's other countries, sure. And I think that the, the trading system now, and there's going to be a push for this, by the way, in terms of the one of the things that, without getting off the other thing, one of the things that's happened is that the, the unwise, in my view, decision of the Obama administration to go forward with the, with the ES, USEU negotiation, besides screwing out of things in the TPP negotiations, is that there, your, Congress is going to have to get into it now. There's no authority for the president to uh, negotiate a green, you know, the so-called trade promotion authority, so the soon people know about it. The administration wisely, in my opinion, was putting that off. Now, the Congress is going to demand, and a part of that, are going to be, we've had a decade of Congress not having given direction to the executive on trade. There's built up on the left and on the right all kinds of things that people want to put in or direct the administration on trade, one of which is going to be currency on trade. And I'm afraid that this, this discussion between Congress and the Obama administration is going to be a, a nightmare. It could just screw up everything. But just my final point, my real point about currency is that there's, there's all this push in the United States to take China to the WTO. The WTO cannot handle this. And the WTO and the IMF together cannot handle it because we don't have the structure to, to do that. You could not, you couldn't get agreement in the first place as to what, what meant if there was a rogue nation. So that's that's wrong. What one other point about I in my paper in terms of Korea, I make the point that I think the United States government should certainly not adopt the negative attitude about Korea and Japan going forward. It's JK. So I don't think we should adopt the negative attitude that any nation should want to go forward with trade legislation. Just as a matter of policy. Uh, or with the reset, I think we should we should say, you know, that's fine with us. They're you know low thousand bottom of bloom. On the other hand, with Korea keep coming back to the fact that two things. One, there is no, you can't just say, well, we got an FTA with the United States, so we're off the hook. There is now a larger regional uh, <coughs> arrangement being formed, or two competing ones. I don't really care if you go, you're in reset to the United States government, I think you should say, fine, be with that. But at some point, you should also join the TPP. And the second thing about that is, again, that there is a, it's not a competition. I don't, I think I've defended the administration of the United States said again and again, it's, it's, the Chinese want to have the world think this is contained. It is not contained, I don't think. I don't think that's the, the well, there were, as I said, diplomatic and security rationale behind what Obama has done in these days. I don't think the main goal, or even a minor group goal, was to be, was to contain China. It's to, it is at the same time something I think different, but could have an impact on that, and that is to retain U.S. leadership or a U.S. position in East Asia. What that means for China, China will have more analysis. Uh, you know, I, I think it's remarkable that these three countries are actually talking about the <coughs> liberalization of trade. You know, if you just go back three decades, it would almost been unimaginable. And so, you know, uh, despite what issues there may be with the CJK. Uh, through trade agreements, the very fact that they're even talking about that, I think it's remarkable. Uh, my question is uh, directed to, uh, <clears throat> toward uh, Scott. Uh, in your research in uh, the uh, China open sor uh, source information, on, have you run into any uh, of the discussions uh, on the so-called um, another aspect of um, regional integration in monetary Asian monetary unit because uh, Asian monetary union union yes I'm just saying yeah, something you know, some discussion there and what's the you know you know what do you think about that and you know from the Chinese perspective uh, it's a good question unfortunately in the in the literature that I reviewed that was not a subject that was discussed. But I think the uh, I think the, uh, the most prominent statement of this was made by the head of the uh, Chinese was it the not the Chinese National Bank whatever the equivalent of the Fed is but 
essentially saying that uh, you know the dollar has too much primacy across the globe, and countries like China are suffering as a consequence of that, and it would be much better to move to alternative currencies like an IMF drawing rights based currency. But I haven't heard much follow up on that uh, since then. So, you know, it's sort of a uh, quick reminder to the United States that it had best get its own you know, financial house in order if it wants not to be subject to challenge. But I, I can hear much more than that. The, the problem with any kind of monetary unification in Asia is other than Japan, no country has a, an exchange of uh, an international trade currency. And even the Japanese, they, they intervene quite a bit, I think Japan does. Uh, and you don't have deep and wide financial markets, with the exception of Japan and somewhat in Korea. Uh, so you don't have the conditions. And I, I differ with TJ. The idea of the IMF creating an international currency, I just find it horrifying. Sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't my idea. I was just oh, oh, okay. Uh, well, well, just bring it up. I've got yeah. enough problems with, with central banks uh, printing yeah. money. But actually, I heard that it was Japan that pushed for this monetary unification. Well, but they, oh, they saw the yen, though, as the anchor. Just a long bit of yeah. There was a question over there. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Sergey Rachinko. I'm uh, with the University of Nottingham, though I live in China. And uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, one about Dr. Barkdale's comment recently that although the United States wants to stay engaged in East Asia and it's, it's trying to lead in Asia, but it, this should not be interpreted as containment. Which, as a historian, um, uh, this reminds me of, um, of, of the Marshall Plan in some ways. Uh, in, in 1947, when Marshall Plan was introduced in Western Europe, this was presented as, as the United States willing to stay in Europe or help Europe recover, etc. But this is not how it was perceived on the Soviet side. This was perceived clearly as containment, and this in fact triggered counter strategies on, part, on Stalin's part. Um, so I, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting parallel anyway, and, and, and it's interesting to, to think about not, of course, you know, it's interesting to see what the U.S. thinks about it, but it's even more interesting to see how China is reacting to this uh, and seeing that as very threatening. Uh, my second comment is, uh, is actually directed to uh, uh, Dr. E, and Dr. E said that he's, a, he's an economist, then, but also I think he's a very good politician because he carefully sidestepped this political issue uh, which was raised, and that is why uh, is uh, South Korea doing this, that is prioritizing uh, FTA with China. Um, I think clearly there is a political issue. I mean, if we look at the, at the, at the basis of this, uh, South Korea can take the U.S. for granted. Uh, it has done it through, you know, throughout the, since 1948, just about, has always taken the U.S. for granted. Um, whereas it cannot take China for granted. China is a, is, a, is a huge political force. China has to be reckoned with, not only for economic reasons, but also for reasons related to North Korea, for example. Uh, China is, is more important here to South Korea than, uh, than, than, than the United States. And here I'm just looking at the political aspect. Um, uh, and, and another issue in this is uh, South Korea is, and this also showed in Dr. E's presentation, South Korea is, is working very hard to project itself as the neutral player in uh, East Asia, it's sort of the mediator, or it's the go-between, and you know it keeps everybody happy, etc. And by he keeping everybody happy, it uh, maximizes its leverage. Uh, and then plays a much bigger role in East, in East Asia. And in this, I think, the, the South Koreans are doing a much better job than the Japanese for you know, basically pissing off the Chinese and, and, and you know, this creates problems for them. Uh, the South Koreans, I think, are learning from this, and that's why they're being so uh, careful. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comments from the authors? Well, I did, you know, this, this is about taking the United States for granted. The, the last paragraph of my paper this is called Ties to the Economic History. I didn't get into it, it was turning out paper to get into this, but the reality is that for the next, for, for the foreseeable future, you know, whatever happens in the budget of the talks in the United States, we're, we're 
how far are we going to go? This going to there's going to be great constraint on the U.S. security or the U.S. security resources. And the Obama administration may make a big deal about shifting and pivoting to Asia, but if you're pivoting and also shifting resources to Asia, but if you're shifting a smaller amount of resources, it still means there's a net negative. Okay. Uh, where I would tie the trade to the security is that I think it would be a lot easier in the future to persuade the U.S. Congress that we have a stake in Asia if we, are, if we succeed with something like the TPP. And I say that, I mean, the other point that is I think this is a high risk venture for the United States TPP. I think it's no more than 50-50 that it will succeed. Uh, but that there is a direct tie there uh, between the uh, trade policy of the United States and whether it succeeds or not, and our ability to continue uh, to take the world given the limited resources. I, I would like to ask Scott. Oh, did I did you finish? Yes. Was, oh, I'd like to ask Scott a question. What's the Chinese perspective of TPP? And how do they react to it? Do they see it as a hostile action? Uh, from my view, they should be in it, more the merrier. Uh, the Chinese view on TPP, of course, there is no singular Chinese view on TPP, so uh, the debate within China tends to shift very strongly on one side, that is a view that was articulated uh, essentially that TPP is a strategy of containment, it's the soft economic edge of containment. Um, the Chinese somehow gloss over the fact that, of course, TPP existed before it was actually not a U.S. plot, it's something the U.S. adopted and, and then essentially spun up into a much bigger and more ambitious project, at which point you could begin to make an argument that, okay, well, but it has implications for us that are negative. If, if the Chinese view is uh, we're always going to be a state-dominated economy, uh, the state-owned enterprises are the model that we want to build along, and so anything that, that requires you to move away from that is hostile to our country, uh, those within a Chinese perspective, left-leaning or, or national socialist, if you will, uh, viewpoints treat TTP as a threat. Uh, from within the Chinese perspective, right-leaning or more liberal, more market-oriented analysts say, in essence, well, we are not there right now, but we should move in a direction where one day we can aspire to join TPP because it's essentially going to uh, harmonize the standards and increase our ability to export, and if we get the economy reforming again. Bear in mind, you know, what, what's happened from the late 1990s when Jurong, Premier Zhu Rongji made a lot of structural changes to the Chinese economy in order to get into the WTO, through the 2000s as they were getting into the WTO and adapting, they moved away very strongly from a lot of the reforms that really gave vigor to China's economy, which is why you've seen entire discussion about uh, the state is advancing and the private sector is retreating. And, um, so in that sense, you know, some of the advocates of TPP, uh, or some of those who don't advocate ch that China should view TPP as particularly threatening, uh, are those same rightists within the Chinese political spectrum who say, you know, we shouldn't be an authoritarian, one-party, state-dominated economy. We should be a more liberal rule of law um, private sector driven economy and society. And so, you know, those voices today in China, as all of you know, are not the dominant voices. And that's why I think, you know, you have the more left leaning statist people who are in favor of uh, a nationalistic or socialized economy um, being stronger and, and, and driving the debate the same as the Just one technical point to add, and that is that TPP is being considered by all the participants as an open negotiation yeah. so that conceivably once any agreements are reached other countries can try and join so long as they are prepared to meet those standards but as i think you're saying china would see the standards as terribly challenging to their domestic economy so they would not have the interest in joining uh, and they'll be watching and they'll be watching the key case will be vietnam yeah. vietnam and, and singapore to some extent but singapore only has a couple of big state-owned companies, the GIC and Tomasic, but the Vietnamese will really be the ones who are setting the bar for what happens to state-owned enterprises, and can China ever meet that bar, or is it going to have to be a completely different China for whatever we have a chance of job? Or what you actually can negotiate with SOBs and TPP. Vietnam has a real serious problem here. 
state owned enterprises and huge non performing loans. But I went, are there any questions? Any? I just have one question for TJ. Uh, do you think Japan's interest in TPP is genuine, given that they would have to make <laughs> structural changes there? Or is this just a political chess game from their perspective? I think it all depends on, on how big the carve outs will be. Uh, I mean, right now, if I'm not mistaken, Japan's rice price tariffs are about 788%. Now, if that can go down to 740%, the Japanese will be very happy. If it goes to 300%, they probably won't be. Uh, but I mean, and that, you know, that's just a metaphor for pork and distribution, et cetera. I think they're going into it with the notion that it's going to be a long time before that anything is finalized. And so I think they're going in relatively seriously, but it does not. To, for them to meet any kind of minimal TPP standards is going to require substantial structural reform at home. And I think the real un unanswered question is whether Abe and the rest of the LDP is really prepared for the kind of structural reform that they so resisted in, uh, you know, after Koizumi. Uh, I don't believe they are because they're trying to uh, get the Bank of Japan to carry the burden. Uh, you know, it's like that uh, August cover of The Economist, stand back, I'm a central banker, you take care of everything. Yes, I agree. Uh, in the business community in Japan, uh, TPP or you know something like this is some kind of a politically incorrect thing to talk about. It's like a taboo, you know. I've been talking to um, you know a lot of people in Japan. They have this, but in the security community, it's a totally different story. Well, we've gone a little bit over our time. I don't know if they kick us out of here. But uh, this has been <laughs> uh, I, I found the four papers and the presentations fascinating. I'm not sure who did. This discussion uh, adding value. So let's give everybody a hand.